Good everybody. First, we have no the report out. We have no reportable action on our closed session item for this evening. Do we have any special presentations or announcements? Can you say that better? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor. All right. Public comment. Public comment at this time. Public participation is welcomed and invited at all city council meetings. This time is set aside for residents of the rest of the city council. <clears throat> on matters listed on matters listed on the consent agenda as well as other items not included on the regular agenda. If your comments concern an item noted on the regular agenda, please address the council when that item is open for public comment. The city requests that persons addressing the city refrain from making personal, slanderous, profane, and disruptive remarks. Council members when recognized by mayor may ask. Questions of the presenter, but no action may be taken by the city during public comment section of the meeting. Under the Brown Act, the city council is prohibited from discussing or taking action on any item not listed on the closed agenda. This time is set aside for residents of the city council on matters listed on the consent agenda, as well as other items not included on the regular agenda. If your comments concerns an item noted on the regular agenda, Please address the city council when that item is open for public comment. Please speak into the microphone from the podium. The podium electronically adjusts up and down to accommodate the speaker. Should you need any additional special accommodations, remote microphone, please note the city clerk prior to the start of the meeting for arrangements. Please state your name for the record prior to providing your comments. Please address the council as a whole. If you have documents to present, please provide a minimum of seven copies. Please limit your remarks to five minutes. Public comment is not intended to be a question and answer period or conversation with the council or city staff. That would be public comments at this time. Go ahead, I will be back in the next city council meeting in the seven hundred. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, you do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You want to come state your name for the record, please? Oh, Mark Atwood. Right. Thank you. Mark, do you have any other copies? Uh oh. Oh, okay. Uh, Don Marie, I've lost her voice again. Uh, she asked me to uh, leave the statement for her. Uh, so, next meeting for Don Marie Austin. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to all our city employees, the city manager, the mayor, and any other council person who helped with putting a warming shelter together so far this year. Thank you to the church for helping by opening the doors, as well as Dr. Sarah Clark from the county. When I saw our temperature for the night of February 28th, the first thing I did was call our board supervisor, Nancy Ogren. They asked why we did not have a warming shelter for that night, uh, as it was not advertised anywhere. I was told she personally worked all that week, as well as the week before, before my recent city manager, Dave Ledbetter, to get the warming center open. She said he must have fallen down on the job. 
She said she had personally worked her tail off getting things done. I'm not saying she does not care. She does. And I know that uh, two years ago, I got her involved with this issue by calling her on a Christmas vacation while out of state. <clears throat> she got involved right away and don't say why. I asked her why the Siskiyou County Public Health Director, Shelly Davis, was not involved. She said that she had asked her many times to help, and her answer every time was no. She would help with needles for nursing, but that was it. <clears throat> I found this very interesting because when I called the governor's office, I was told that the state sent millions of dollars to the county of 50 for homeless as it's a public health issue, and that, that is their job. I'm not saying the county is not helping. I'm saying that when you have elected officials throwing city managers under the bus because in all that quote, their research, they see cities putting the bill for the homeless, unquote. I call BS. It took me five seconds with Google to see the state gives the money to the county. The county is supposed to give that money to the city. Not hold it for three years and then hire people to figure out how to best spend it. Watching many other cities with the money the counties are giving them come up with uh, Project Currency and other good ideas for warming children. Those cities have done this because their county gave them money. But with cities who are totally responsible for the homelessness, the state would have given them millions of these cities. In that case, my region would have had this homeless problem in three years ago. It said we sit here with good traction on a shoulder and only a possible project home key in the work. As, as I was told by Nancy Ogren, among others, when asked, she warned me about shooting these projects in the foot by yelling to about it. As if one person, a citizen, they caused the county to stop doing their job. One person, an elected official, can do their actual job by way of ordering the county to get things done. We have to do better. We have a third world situation up on the hill. They have no running water, no hot food, no fire or work, and no money to get these things that are all neat, just to stay alive. The state of California has a list of things for persons experiencing homelessness. Otherwise, they end up in unsanitary living conditions, and exposure to severe weather in the line. All I'm asking you is to please help with this being the coldest, wettest, wettest winter in a long time. It's a wet, muddy hellhole up there in the And we need to do better to save lives and open the shoulder for good today. Also, uh, last time we went by there, we noticed the dump service going. Mm -hmm. no, no place to put garbage. The garbage was all over the hill. Thank you. Thank you, and we had a comment from some other that the people online did not hear the citizens at the microphone. Can we check that microphone, please. <laughs> oh, so there. This is a test. Juliana, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can hear you, and I heard um, the last yeah, speaker. Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? She's here. She is not muted. Um, can you hear me? I'm not sure I'm getting her. Can you get on the chat and see if they can well, hear me? Let, let me answer for her. Um, she um, she could hear. I, think her, so I could I'm hear listening. both Jason and the previous speaker. Okay. Mr. Hinion, can you hear me? We did get acknowledgement. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> no, we're not. Well, we're not do it again. Please, please, please speak in the mic. I mean, come to the mic. Make sure we speak, speak directly and loudly. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I don't hear it well. Okay. Just, just be very close and very loud into the microphone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Glenn White. And a long time Irish resident. And first of all, he would like to commend you 
I know I'm not supposed to talk about this until the time, but I want to commend you about coming on and getting an individual that's going to work with the homeless. Just come close to the microphone, please. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> they can't hear you online. Okay, well, uh, <clears throat> because I think it's a great thing to have that option available for uh, people that need assistance. The only problem I'm going to talk about today is not necessarily, oh, by the way, potholes and stray cats. That, that's for next month. <laughs> That's a joke. I'll be, we'll be here. So uh, I'm going to talk about the homeless situation. I'm going to talk about illegal activities within our Greenway and Greenhorn parks. I don't know how you can identify uh, that is a homeless issue until, of course, you begin to take a look and do some investigation. Because until that time, when citizens come to you uh, as a whole entity and make complaints about individuals uh, depositing garbage on public ground, which of course is 9.4.8.2.0.0, misdemeanor, by the way, $500, six months in jail, Injuries to public property in and about the parks and greenway projects, which again is a misdemeanor, uh, punishable by $500 fine and six months in jail. And of course, it is the uh, 9.48.240 of the municipal code, littering uh, 9.50, illegal camping 9.50.020. Illegal campfires, which I think should be a felony uh, and should be addressed immediately because, by the way, the next huge fire that probably takes up Greenhorn Park will be from a illegal campfire, not necessarily from an eight-year-old standing on their lawn with a sparkler. Uh, so anyway, that's just my position on that. Human waste, which is the health and safety code, and toxic and chemical waste that are leaching from the myriad of dumps in and about Greenhorn Park and the Greenway into and through Greenhorn into the reservoir, which I think still is a uh, city water system, and then into uh, Wairika Creek, which we know is a protected anatomous fishery for the endangered coho salmon. So, when citizens come to staff and make these reports, it's inherent that those reports are investigated immediately. When you email and send pictures, and by the way, it's did council get a copy of these pictures on their city of Wairika uh, web pages? Were they addressed uh, from, from you? Or mm -hmm. From you? Yes. I did not. Sorry. Okay, well, that's weird because I sent them. Uh, they should probably go ahead and uh, take into consideration investigating those reports immediately. Not saying, well, we will notify the code enforcement officer who can't deal with misdemeanors. They're not law enforcement. Make sure you're right. Make sure you're back to the mic, Mike, Mr. Mike. Correct. Who can't deal with public nuisance dumping of trash and garbage because that's also a misdemeanor. Those types of things need to be investigated immediately by law enforcement officers. Uh, and not sloughed off to these individuals who might get them in a couple of weeks. Because you don't know what you have until you get there and you investigate. You don't know if that's homeless. You don't know if there's just some individual uh, dumping their trash because they don't want to pay the fees at the dump. You don't know that until you investigate. You can't Thank you, Mr. Lyon, your five minutes is up. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. 
And I'm going to hand the card, my card, um, to Mr. Leather. We hand to you for the correct email address. So you can email those to me. Oh, that was five minutes, huh? Yes, it was five minutes. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yeah. So, what am I supposed to do with this? Um, email me because I did not receive, I don't know if any other council received an email. The other council said they received an email from you. Um, so, my email is on my card. Um, I'll make sure I get the board on to the rest of the council members. Yeah, so, if you want to resend that, that would be great. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. 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 Do I have any other public comment? Another public comment this time. We'll move on to the item eight, the consent agenda. All items, all items listed under the consent agenda are considered routine and non-controversial and will be enacted by one motion unless any member of the council wishes to remove any item for discussion. A, approval ratification of payments issued from February 13th, 2023 through February 26th, 2023. B, approval of minutes of the Razor meeting held February 21st, 2023. C, cash balance of budget to actual and fiscal performance report for January 2023. D, approval of City Council Resolution 2023-09, approving the transmission of the 2022 general plan and housing element annual project report. E, continued action emergency ordinance number 864, fireworks. F, way full text reading of all ordinances on the agenda. Ordinances shall be introduced and adopted by title only. In front of you is the recommended city council action. Motion to adopt consent agenda of the city council of the city of Barbica as presented. What is the wishes of the council? Mr. Mayor. Yes. I'd like to have item eight to be yeah. from the consent agenda for discussion. Yeah. And I have the statement call 8D from the consent agenda for discussion. Is that okay with the rest of the council? Is that okay? Is that okay, Mr. Davis? Council Davis? Uh, 8, 8D, you want to have the discussion for tonight and then come back to that 8D, correct the speaker? Yeah. Okay, one well, time, please. Councilman Baker is requesting item A to D for removal from the consent agenda for discussion. Is that okay? And is that for tonight or for their council meeting? Councilman Baker? No, I just want to discuss it. Okay. Okay. So he's got to be separate for this meeting. So what are the wishes of the council? Yeah. No. no. I don't know his opinion as a city manager when you read the um, public comment, it addresses that if someone has a preliminary consent agenda, it's informing them of public comment regarding that consent agenda, and we do not go back to them on item number eight. I'll just go down with that. Okay. <laughs> I was informed it was wrong. Which is why I can't hear you, Dwayne. And state that item eight for the consent agenda. Or do you want to go ahead? Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Leather. Mr. Leather, Mr. clarify the item eight consent agenda. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, this is Jake Leather, the city manager. So ultimately, when uh, the mayor reads section six in the first, um, it's the second sentence. This time is set aside for residents to address the city council on matters listed on the consent agenda, as well as other items not on the regular agenda. So technically, we're already inferring to the public that if they have an item on consent they want to address that now is the time during regular public comment. But ultimately, as Ms. Um, Councilmember Baker has asked to remove an item, then that item will have uh, by default public okay. comment for item number two, correct? Eight, two, yeah. Okay, Mr. Mayor, may I ask for some clarification since we have our attorney online? I wasn't aware that when we ask items to be pulled off the agenda, that we have to get the approval of the other council members to do so. So, can I have some clarification on that? Mr. Higgins? 
You may. Point um, of order, actually, I'm going to give the audience my phone number um, on this temporary computer that we use. The speakers can hear each other on Zoom. However, they cannot speak to us. So I'm offering my phone number to them to take to the city manager so you can hear it. I do apologize. It's been a night on technical issues. Okay. It, will that... So for the audience um, on Zoom, if you can call in, if you have something to say, the number is 530-340-6101. Okay, Mr. Henry, did you hear Councilman Baker's question regarding the consent agenda when the council member has an item to pull? If we have to go for consensus for our consent the then the other council members are not for that item to be a simple right. discussion. I'm going to be sitting here as the city manager, and I believe that I, that is the right of any city council member to pull any yes, item off of the consent. And that it does not require, and ultimately, unless you had something in your code of conduct policy, but even no, then, this is right. would be. Unfair to not allow. Are you there? Yes. Hi, Don. Hi, Don. Hi. So, do you want to just. Don, do you, do you want... I'm going to get you on the speaker. Okay, good. City Attorney Henny can address now. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, Councilman Baker. Um, your, Your question, question is appropriate. Is appropriate. When you've asked, asked to pull an item, item off, off the, agenda, the agenda, it does not need the approval of the rest of the, rest of the council. council. Thank you. Thank you. You're, You're welcome. welcome. And item B is 8B is full. For discussion. For discussion. Yes, uh, Mr. Council, looks like I ask that uh, consent agenda item A D be uh, be moved to the last item tonight on our uh, on our agenda, please, so we can uh, conduct the other business that we have that's newer. We do have um, in this case, Mother City Manager. We do have Miss Lucchese online to address whatever questions may arise from this. So I would advocate if we could take care of it now so she could uh, move on to the rest of her. I'm just, I'm not in agreement with you. Um, with all due respect, uh, to Amanda Ledbetter, I'm not in agreement with you. I'd like to see it move to the last item. We're going to pull it out. We have other business items. This is a business meeting. This is something that's been decided upon. We can go back and discuss it. But we have other items and we have other business that we need to conduct tonight. And in the, in, you know, and, and the last time that we, uh, discuss this. It was probably about a two-hour discussion or longer. Um, granted, there were more people in the gallery, but um, I feel that it will probably be a lot. We will all have some. Uh, all five of us will have, and including yourself, Casey, and perhaps some audience members will have some uh, things to say. And my concern is that we let it get away from us, and then we, um, and then we, um, we don't get the business done. And this is a business meeting. I don't mind going back over. That's fine. But either that, or can we just limit it to say fifteen minutes? Can we put a time limit on? Yeah, this is the city manager once again. I think there may be some confusion. This is just a progress report to the city. There's no action uh, at all, and I think that it would be wise for us to entertain Ms. Lucchese to kind of maybe clear up any confusion that may exist on this item because literally it's all. It's a mandated progress report from every city in the state of California back to HCD. And um, it ultimately, I, I don't see it being a long discussion personally. Again, this is Councilman McCoy, with all due respect, if it is a mandated report, why isn't it being done uh, somewhere else within the, within the, uh, uh, the agenda rather than put on uh, consent? Okay. Again, where we have to then okay. this time decide to pull it off and then vote on everything else and then I'll come back. Give John Speaker when I can. Ms. Lucchese is also available to speak on that item, right? Yeah, so I guess we need to go back to the wishes of the council for item 8A. 
Okay. Thank you. I, if I could make a, if I could make a, maybe a suggestion, could we vote on the yeah. consent? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You can make the and then um, ultimately you don't have to make the You can determine what you would like to do. Okay. Yes. So I will go back to the council for their wishes for the consent agenda. I'll make a motion that we approve A, A, B, C, E, and F as presented. And, uh, and K, Y, and D. Yes. Okay. I have a motion from uh, Council Member K. Yes, that's right. This is Council McCoy. I'll second the motion. And a second from Mr. McCoy. I'll do roll call. Council K. Council Davis. Aye. Council Baker. Aye. Councilman McCoy? Aye. And I will be aye. So um, I will go back to item B D on the agenda and just ask that the wishes are of the council, whether we discuss item B now or place it at the end of the agenda item. What is the wishes of the council or what is the members? Mr. I ask a question. Sure. Uh, <laughs> sure. Is this clarification or because so this all goes back to what uh, Colleen was requesting. So is this a clarification or is it going to be a, a detailed discussion? I just have two questions. Yeah, I think we should. I think we just. I think we should be covered now and move on with the meeting. Let's just get the questions answered from the speaker right away. <laughs> Okay. 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 So I'm going to uh, mm -hmm. Councilman McCoy. Is it questions or is it a report? But, but I want to stipulate what we're doing. Are we doing questions? Or we... She said that she has two questions from this. She's on the line. I mean, I'll just I'll just let you guys know that ultimately, anytime you pull an item off of consent, it then just becomes like any other item. On the agenda, so ultimately it would just be treated as though how we normally would have an open discussion about the item, and eventually you guys would vote, and then before that you would take public comment. So, okay. So um, I will go to um, Councilman Davis to ask. Uh, I'm sorry, Councilman Baker to ask her questions on um, the PC. That's regarding AD. Thank you so much. Um, and it's, okay, you know, cool. um, I did send an email um, to uh, just receive some clarification. Um, my concern at first was I was I saw the resolution, and the item on the agenda is to approve a resolution authorizing approving the transmission of the um, general plan and housing element annual progress report. And my concern was I did not see a specific report. But you were very kind and pointed out to me that the memorandum that you have that accompanies this item is actually the report. So my questions to you are, um, is the report that's being submitted, um, can it, be put in a form, the actual report that would come back to us with the resolution so that we could see actually what's being submitted to the state versus just um, a um, an overview, a memorandum from you. Hey, can you guys hear me? I'm going to do my best. So there is no other information. Sorry, give me a second. <laughs> there we go. Let's let's try that. Um, so there is no other information. So the state of California has moved to online reporting. So basically the information in that memo is going to be just sent to them. And it's kind of like a fill in the box form. So there really is no printable report at this time. So if I return on March 21st, 
it's going to be the same information. So the state of California um, provides an online reporting system, but yet we are adopting um, a resolution by paper. And so that, that is a little confusing to me. And my concern is that um, we're approving, I would be voting adopting a resolution to submit a report when I haven't had the opportunity to review the report itself. And that's my concern. So the, the memo that I provided is the report. So for example, the information that's presented to you that we've had one issued single family residential permit and one final residential permit that's in like the building section, all of that information is the report. So, I, I mean, I, I can bring it back at the next meeting and I can make it look prettier, but it's going to be the same information. And is there any additional information that will be submitted uh, to the state of California um, with this report? No, this is it. So basically, I think backing up a little bit, this is a, a annual progress report on goals, policies, and programs that you had worked on as a city in the year 2022. Because the city's general plan expired in 2022, we have no goals, policies, or programs to report on because what we're working on is a general plan update. So all we respond to them for this annual reporting is that we are working on a general plan update. The projected final de uh, date for approval is in 2024. So that's really all we share with them. And then in terms of the housing and community development information, it's just reporting how many housing permits we gave out and how many we finaled. And so that is in the memo that's in your uh, packet. So again, you know, my position is, I understand what you're saying, but my position is I just feel like I would be irresponsible if I were approving and putting my name on a resolution without seeing the actual document of the report itself. And so I would prefer, um, and again, this is up to the council as a whole, but my preference is to bring this back and bring back the actual report in the format that's going to be submitted to the state. So again, you're gonna, sorry, sorry. There's too many phones. So again, you're, you know, I'm finally tabling it to the next meeting. We have to submit it by April 1st, but I would really need you to be very specific what you're looking for, because right now this is just gonna come back to you in the same form, because this is the report. And so will this memo be submitted to the state of California as the report? Yes, with the resolution, that information is entered into the uh, online database, which that's the information we present. There's no like final PDF form. There's no like upload function. It's just the information that's in the memo. And so how is the resolution submitted to the state? That is submitted as a PDF. That's the only thing that we can submit to them in a PDF format. Okay, thank you. So like I said, I'm, I'm happy to do whatever you'd like, but I, I just need kind of some really concrete direction on what you're looking for. It doesn't sound like, doesn't sound like it's going to change though, whether you know, she asked you the question, and you answered because it might have still change coming back. Yeah. It's going to be the same document provided that you're providing for us tonight, correct? This is the city manager. I'm just going to chime in here just so people have an understanding. What it sounds like is transpiring is that ultimately there is a website for the state where we are only allowed to upload a resolution and they are asking questions that then. From the memo, information is ripped out of this memo and then 
placed into the box where you can input data, but there's no actual generating report that we could print out and supply the city council. Is that accurate, Juliana? Okay, say it again, Juliana. Yes. Yes, so it needs to be a report. But the state moved to an online kind of form reporting system two years ago. So there's no big report anymore that we have to produce. But we still have to do the transmission resolution that you, the council, saw the information and passed it on. Does that make sense? Yes. So if we're uploading the resolution, then can we upload this memo as well? In addition to filling out the, the boxes. Could you re repeat the question for her? She's going back and forth between phones. So oh, yeah, I think if you don't mind, Ms. Baker. It, is it, Juliana, are we allowed to basically, as an attachment to the resolution, make sure that the memo is part of the resolution, thereby compromising so that we know that at least we have documentation that HCV understands the intent of the resolution that the city council would be voting on here this evening? Sure. I, I don't see why we couldn't. Um, and again, I just want to, you know, voice my concern to the rest of the council. I, I'm not really comfortable putting my name on a resolution for a report that's being submitted. And I have no doubt that this information is going to be transmitted. But I, I my concern is, what if there's more information that they ultimately ask for? And we've approved uh, a resolution. So th that's my concern. So I guess I take eight item eight B back to the floor for if the council wants to. Oh, I'm sorry. Public, uh, uh, public comment on item eight. Also, no one has a for item eight. The on the consent agenda. Any public comment? I will close public comment and then I'll go back to the council. So, um, it doesn't. Well, doesn't. Well, anyway. I don't think it's going to change what it sounds like. So what I'll do is, um, I guess, I'll go to the floor for a vote for item AD for approval or a disapproval or any discussion. Yeah, discussion. Juliana, are you still there? Go ahead, Juliana. Yeah, I'm still here. Good. <laughs> Um, uh, Councilwoman Baker had a good question. Um, I'm not trying to paraphrase it, uh, Councilwoman Baker, but uh, something to the effect of if they want more info, then what, and, and we signed off on this, and what do we do? The second. <clears throat> so if the state of California wants more information, I provide them more information. But in, in my experience doing these reports, they don't ask for additional information. They just want the basic information, which, as I stated before, they just want to know if you're working on a general plan update or what goals, policies, and programs you worked on in 2022. And then they want to know how many housing permits you issued and what kind of housing that is. Thank you. I'm going to just count the floor. I yield the floor back to the mayor. Any further questions? Council member, any further questions? Get your screen on. No other questions. The mic is on. Um, so I'll take it back to the floor just for the wishes of the council for item 88. What are the wishes of the council? So I'd like to make the motion that we actually adopt this resolution as long as this memo that was presented to the city council this evening is submitted along with the resolution. Okay. Uh, first for Councilman Baker, point of order. Is our attorney Henion on? Yes. 
Oh, I'm here. I don't know if you can hear me. Hello. Don, you'll have to call Greta. I just hung up on her so you can call her. Oh, okay. If uh, this is the city manager, I, I believe that you have the leeway on the verbiage change that is completely appropriate because you're not changing okay, the conversation that was had here tonight. Do you know me well because I'm very uncomfortable with making a change right now. I, I think it needs to come back to us at the next meeting. So, can we call the attorney is on? Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Don? Go ahead, Don. Can you, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, yeah, I'll paraphrase. This is Jason Ledbetter. So ultimately, what we had is we had a change to the recommended. Well, actually, in this instance, we didn't really have a recommended motion because it was a part of consent. But uh, Council Member Baker has advocated that within the motion on 8B, beyond approving the resolution, but she would also like added information that is in the staff report attached to the submittal to the state and our planning director will have to that would not be a problem. And Mayor Pro Tim wants to make sure that motion is a motion. Um, yeah, you can make any motion that you choose. And if you approve the motion with an additional attachment that the state happens to reject, then um, that, that's on them. Okay. So the motion comes from Baker for approval of the D at the city agenda with the um, added attached PDF of the um, Right. Okay. Yeah. Memorandums. Memorandums. Okay. In a second, from Councilman Kay, I will go for a roll call. Councilman Kay. Aye. Aye. Councilman Davis. Aye. Councilman Baker. Aye. Pro Tim McCoy. Aye. And I. All right. Thank you. All right. Mr. Mayor, if you don't mind, I mean, uh, we're having some technical difficulties here this evening, and if it would be okay. Since we do have the executive director of the group drive on, is it appropriate in your eyes to move to item 10A? Uh, yes, I don't see any no problem with that. If that's okay with the council, we just have um, a gentleman from the group tribe on Zoom. And for our technical difficulties, is that we move to eight? Uh, I'm sorry, item 10. 10A, yes. 10A. I can introduce that. Uh, Josh, if you were on the line, and I believe that uh, Retta, can you work out with them the, the phone call situation? And I can uh, introduce this item. Thanks, Josh. We're putting you on. I'm going to take it off the phone. So, okay. Thank you. So, yeah, this is Jason Ledbetter, City Manager. So, Josh will join us here from the Creek Tribe on item 10A. Uh, but we were approached by the Creek Tribe, and what we have before you this evening is a letter opposing, and forgive me, I'm going to probably not pronounce this correctly, but a letter opposing the Coquille Indian Tribe's application to transfer key land in Medford, Oregon, into trust for the purpose of opening a second gaming facility, also known as the Medford Project. And this is on behalf of the Creek Tribe and the team members at Rain Rock Casino based off of how it could affect the economy here in the city of Wairika, including the number of our citizens who are employed at Rain Rock Casino. And so Josh, if you've got everything worked out for you. Okay, thank you. So there are some technical difficulties as we do this. When he speaks, he has to turn his volume off. Everyone who does, if your back keys are so bad, you know, we ask questions. Sometimes they miss the question. I'm gonna try coming down here, so hopefully, They'll be able to hear your thoughts on the phone and follow the phone. So if that works for everyone, go ahead. Then. You can be Josh. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. Fantastic. Um, I did this, I turned the volume down on my on all the time. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. Um, through the call in the phone. 
Uh, again, my name is Josh Sachs. I'm the executive director of the Tennessee Trust. And I'm here on behalf of uh, the Tennessee Trust. The city of Clark, the city of Lyrica, uh, submit a um, uh, opposition letter. It's a, probably a good idea to give you all some background on the history of this project. Um, in 2012, uh, the Cokeville Indian tribe uh, requested that the Department of Interior um, move some property that they had bought to invest for in the trust. In 2020, that request was denied. And that was, um, I believe, under the Trump administration. Um, there's a, a Department of Interior a secretary. Um, Submitted a uh, denial letter to the Coastal Indian Tribe, but more recently it has come back um, as, a, as a draft environmental impact statement again, more recently uh, in December of 2026. Um, most of the components of their pre state environmental impact statement remain the same, which is one of the main points of concern. Uh, obviously, um, in the draft or in the environmental impact uh, study previously, our uh, casino wasn't up and running at that time on the operations, and so there is a very cursory uh, impact mm -hmm. that they considered and adopted the final impact statement. We just recently conducted our own um, economic impact study, and as the letter states, it's fairly significant uh, impact, and that impact trickled down to our partners like the city of Wairica. As you, uh, as you can see in the letter, um, there's a lot of things that we partner on, both in our HEA um, payments and, and recurring uh, things that we provide for the city. Um, there is uh, law enforcement, there's uh, facilities, uh, there's wastewater, there's fire department. Um, there's a lot of things that we've actually done since the opening of the gaming operation. Uh, and then we also provide uh, a lot of um, benefits in terms of employment, medical care, and those kinds of things for not just the city of Miami residents, but the county as well. We are the largest non federal employer in the city county. And uh, we value our partnership. Um, I have uh, had the pleasure of getting to know city staff a lot more over the last four to five years and have had. Uh, enjoy a great relationship uh, with not just those folks, but the city of Lyric and in and in many instances. Um, the Tennis Tribe has submitted um, letters of support for a lot of the grant proposals that the city of Lyric has submitted. And um, and those for the most part have been very successful uh, partnerships, uh, both for us and for the city. So at this time I think I will all open up for questions. If anyone has any questions on the proposed letter or the or the version in it, um, there is very there's, I, I'm only aware of one tribe in Oregon that supports this project. And all of the elected leaders so far um, that, that we have spoken to have submitted letters of opposition. The one uh, congressman that, that we are still uh, speaking with and that we think is going to probably um, submit a letter of opposition is Clifford Beck, who is the congressman for the Medford area. Um, just recently, the city of Medford um, voted to be neutral on the project. That, um, for the most part, 95% of uh, anyone affected by this by this uh, project is opposed to the project. So, any questions? Thank you, Josh. I will open up to the public for any comments if they have any um, <clears throat> questions for you. Any public comment or questions for Josh from the group chat? We have one question from the audience member, but she lost her voice, so she's going to have her husband read it here, I think, in a minute. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, do you want to give it to Mark to read, maybe, since you have the microphone? Okay. What is the difference between the one in Reading and this one? Yeah. The one that you're proposing, Josh, did you hear that question over there? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, the question was, what is the difference with that? It's the movement, the, the, the proposed move of the Reading Casino to the, to the freeway I-5 on their new property there. So the, 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 the next was 
Yes. So I'm going to try to answer this because I was based on this in the last couple of weeks. So, so Ray, Rancheria withdrew their application to do an environmental impact statement on that project. Um, so that currently, uh, that move is on pause uh, in red. And, and I, I believe that they are looking to uh, garner more uh, local support for that move. But currently, they're moving the, the Medford um, uh, casino move is actually 170 miles away from their current administrative offices. That's one of the reasons why the Department of the Interior denied their application last time. When in fact the Reading um, project is much different, they're actually um, planning on closing down their present casino if and when they were able to build a new casino on the I-5 uh, property uh, uh, closer to the freeway. Much, much different project. So I hope that answers your question. Maybe some other questions. I think what he's stating, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. So the proposed Medford Casino, this is the mayor who built it. Um, Medford Casino, their headquarters is 170 miles from Medford, so they have no ties to Medford, and they're trying to change the land into their tribal land, correct? Where the Roxy Hand Lane is currently located, is that correct? So th there's a nuance to their restored land legislation. So they, they had a restored land legislation that basically brought about their um, ability to um, place uh, property into trust. And um, actually, Senator Merkley, I believe, was the author of that. Um, there were a couple of authors of that, Senator Merkley being one of them. And he's actually opposed to this move as well, because it was not the legislative, legislative intent that Club Will is able to use multiple casinos on multiple properties. Um, there's there's verbiage in their report land that, that speaks to um, a seed of trust capability in five counties, Jackson County being one of them. But it's it, it, it's a it's a interpretation issue as to whether that Jackson County um seed of trust uh, uh, opening is 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 just for property or is it for property for gaming? And so that's where the that's where the uh, the fight lies. Is that and that's where the you know for, for those of us who are opposed to this, our interpretation of the rules and regulations of IGRA is that this is not this this piece of trust property is not eligible for gaming based on based on um the the IGRA rules and the IRA, which is the Indian Reorganization Act. Okay, thank you. All right, any other public comment or questions? Okay, I will open up to the council for questions. Josh up to the crew tribe. Any council member have any questions? Mayor, um, Councilman Davis have a question. This is Councilman Davis. The area that we're talking about, does that come under the Rogue River Indian? Area for possible development into a casino, or is it for Keel Drive doing an outreach out of their area? Josh, did you have the question from Councilman Davis? I did not. Can you speak louder? Yeah. Okay, so he's asking if this area that you're talking about putting the casino as part of the road river. For the road nation plan, or the part of the field doing the outreach. So the, so from our understanding from um, uh, archaeological records is that this this uh, land in and around Medford is actually associated with the Grand Non tribe more closely than any other tribe. We we do have um, Aboriginal. Um, uh, ties to um, uh, some some of that area, but it's not it's, it's not Aboriginal ties in terms of ancestral territory. It's, it's more it's mainly trading routes uh, that we share uh, along that area um, for for uh, you know free contact um, for the most part all free contact uh, trading routes. Uh, but but as far as 
that where that land sits and who, who what, what tribe would typically have pre contact, um, the most pre contact uh, uh, tied to that land is the Grand Rock tribe. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, so, so what I got out of that is that you have the uh, outreach into that area. So it's a Karuk tribe area. Is that correct? Is that what I hear? I'm not sure what you mean by outreach. He doesn't know what you mean by outreach, Mr. Davis. Oh, oh that that is in your uh, nation. <laughs> Would that be correct? I'm still not clear on that. So, so is, that, is, that, is that ground that you people, the Karooks, have lived in and cultivated in and fished in? Is that what you're telling me? In terms of Medford, no. Our ancestral territory is fairly well defined in terms of free contact, and then we also have what's called post contact uh, service area. And and um, post contact um, uh, areas of influence that include um, you know uh, places outside of our ancestral territory, uh, like our Sisky County, which includes White Okay, thank you. But our service area does not go into Oregon. So we, we we have thought about you know ways to reach our tribal membership that do live in Grant Pass and Metro and. Um, K Junction, we have a significant number of tribal members up there, um, but unfortunately, due to IHS restrictions, we have mm -hmm. been a challenge to try to uh, increase our service area into that into that All right, thank you. Any other questions, Council Member? Okay, Council Member Baker has a question for you, Josh. So, does the Coquille Pride have other casinos? Yes, they, they have uh, the mill casino in Coos Bay. Thank you. They, yeah, they already have a successful gaming operation. Okay. Um, and this would be in addition to that. They, they have no plans to close the mill casino with this. This would be in addition to their current gaming operation. All right, thank you. I will close comments and um, oops. what are the wishes of the council? So the crit tribe is before us for possible action for the motion to authorize the mayor to send a letter in opposition to the Hill Indian tribe's application to transfer land into a trust for the purpose of opening a second gaming facility in Medford. Um, so moved. I have a motion to authorize the uh, letter from the mayor for the opposition from Mr. Council McCoy. Do I have a second? Council McCoy, a second motion. I will go for roll call. Council McCoy, aye. Council Davis, aye. Council Baker, aye. Protein McCoy, aye. And uh, I, Mayor Bateman. All right, thank you, Josh. And we will get a letter together and I will sign it and we will be sending it out. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to go back to item nine. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Mark, for like this. Yeah, so <laughs> put you to work. All right. Okay, we've uh sorry, I'm getting back there. Hold on. Okay, so 9A, Old Business City Manager. This is the homeless liaison contract. Mr. Ledbetter. Yes, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mayor and uh Warwick City Council. This is Jason Ledbetter, your city manager. So we are here tonight to uh kind of rediscuss an older <laughs> item. So on December 20th, 2022, the City Council passed Resolution 2022-63, agreeing to enter in 
into an agreement with the city and Siskiyou County Health and Human Services Agency. The draft MOU that was presented to you at that meeting has now material, materially changed. So unfortunately, uh, it was approved here as an MOU. The MOU was actually drafted by the county themselves when we sent it back to the county and it went back to county council. They wanted to change it into their form contract. And so the contract for services between the city of Wairika and county of Siskiyou uh, presented you presented this evening presented agreement where both the county council and the city attorney have conferred on contract matters. So essentially, uh, in order to speed things along, uh, our attorney, Mr. Hingen, uh engaged, I believe, the attorney from the county. And so we've gotten to this point where we have an agreement that we all are content with in front of you. Uh, the contract presented this evening is in its final form. The term of the agreement remains retroactive from October 1, 2022 to June 30, 2023, or until terminated by either party. The agreement will still be the same compensation for the city for $160,000 annually for the services of a homeless liaison officer. The Wairika Police Department homeless liaison officer is responsible for making connections between those experiencing homelessness and the resources available to further their specific housing and services goal. This includes, but is not limited to, making referrals to providers of housing shelter programs, mental health treatment, substance use treatment, mainstream uh, benefits, education, and employment training. Additionally, the homeless liaison officer will also provide a monthly report for the Continuum of Care Advisory Board, which they currently do with our chief of police. And so inevitably, we also hope that on July 1st, we would be entering into a very similar contract for the same services, but for three years. But ultimately, this evening, we're asking for you guys to finalize the contract in front of you for $160,000. Thank you, Mr. Governor. Uh, I will go to public comment regarding um, the almost layout liaison contract and the officer. I looked over the online, by the way, to see where we go. I looked over the job description. Now, this is a law enforcement officer, correct? Correct. And they're going to be part of the Wairika Police Department. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, nowhere in the duties and responsibilities that say that they will enforce the laws of the city or the state of California. Under their duties. Is that your question? Does that sure. better or does it make uh, their filming? Do you want to address the question? Yeah. Okay. Does it doesn't say it anyway. Well, it doesn't. The views are going to be these types of things right here. I can serve. They did ask if he was going to enforce the laws of the state of California. Sorry? You asked if he was going to enforce the laws of the state of California, correct? Chief Gilman, this is Councilman mm -hmm. Uh When you, when I think a few swearing in to their officers, when you swear them in the contract they sign, don't they uh, swear to protect the laws of California and enforcement? Give them right behind you. <laughs> Ultimately, uh, just one point of order here is that uh, public comment generally addresses the city council. After five minutes is complete, then the city council can choose to answer questions during public comment. But as it's stipulated, public comment is never a question and answer. I stand corrected. Thank you, Mr. Sigmund. I stand corrected. Okay. All right, well, I may answer. <laughs> My public comment time, so I'll go ahead and say that I don't, I don't see anywhere that says they will enforce the law, which is important specifically because. Uh, my concern, of course, would be the fact that, well, uh, there is an issue going on, for example, in Greenhorn Park, or there might be an individual who might be homeless. Well, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and notify the code enforcement officer, and they'll get to it later. Or, well, you know, that might be a homeless issue, and so maybe we should go ahead and let the homeless liaison take care of it. Uh, that doesn't get the job done. In these parks and greenways. I looked at several pictures from old Mark Atwood. He's an amazing guy. You should give him an award. That is the only uh, question I had, other than the fact that I think it's a great idea. And there's also a uh, an interesting article 
video article from the city of Coronado. Uh, if you have not seen that, you should take a look at that. Uh, city of Coronado, which is uh, San Diego, has a population of about 20,000. It started out with over 100 homeless individuals, and the last homeless uh, survey had zero, zero homeless individuals inside the city of Coronado which is an amazing number. The mayor, Richard Bailey, gave an outstanding discussion on what they do in a proactive way to meet the needs of the homeless, but at the same time, holding them to the same accountability that any other citizen within the state of California has held to, to include littering, to include public defecation, urination, defecation, to include drunk in public, to include having fires in non-fire areas, to include having camps in camp areas where they don't need to be when there's an alternative for OUZ. So I think it's a great idea, but we want to make sure that you are cognizant of the fact that every officer at Wyoming Police Department is a homeless liaison. And every one of us also should be aware of what we can do to help these individuals at the same time ensuring that they are held to the same standards as everyone else in our community. Thank you very much. And by the way, look at that video from Coronado. It's amazing. Thank you. At this point, if you don't mind, we can address the okay. Oh, okay. yeah. chief. If you don't mind coming down and kind of addressing um, the, the question over uh, enforcement of laws and on the contract, correct? This is chief. So, this is an additional this change. I'm talking about there's more overall. So, the chief is going to talk about the law. Thank you for all the millions. He was a police officer. He does an amazing job. He just measured that off the LA as a big job. Thank you, Don Marie. Any other public comment? Okay. I will bring it to council for any questions. Comments? Let's go to office and comments. So, uh, yes, uh, obviously they do need the whole block. And one of the big things that we have actually implemented was our critical infrastructure ordinance, which will coincide with that. And with that, once we get, this is just one piece of the element that we're working on. So with this puzzle, this piece and the other pieces that I can't say that we're going to eliminate homeless in Parica, but I can say that we will put um, us on the map on how to handle homelessness in the correct way. Um, and it, it's, it's working. We, you know, working with the county like we are has been huge. This, this last success story with this officer that we're doing through the YPD, that's huge. That's a lot of the other cities aren't doing that. So this is. For our little rural area to be doing this is it's a huge uh, step of accomplishment that's going to make a big difference. And the next step is a, a homeless shelter. The shelter actually is actually going to be um, a place for them actually to receive services. So not only us for Elliot can help them, hope to steer them to proper guidance and maybe they can get to uh, rehab programs, they can get to any of these other programs. That will uh, help them go to the, down the right road and not put them down the road, but to actually help them mm -hmm. with a uh, situation they may be in. Um, if the actually home will show for the next step that we're working on, actually will get them to that next step also. So there's actually a number of pieces of the puzzle. And that's why I'm just you know saying because I deal with this on a on a daily basis too. And, and uh, it's been it's been a huge obstacle for all of us in the city of Laredo, the whole state of California. State of California um, currently houses over fifty percent of the homeless population of the United States. So it's it's West Coast. 
houses almost 80% of um, the homeless population in the United States. So it's a huge problem, and we all need to work together. So thank you for that information, too. I appreciate that. I'm going to look into it very in depthly and see if we can take some of those, those things. Um, the main thing we need you know, to look at when it comes to homelessness is not kicking the can down the road, but actually addressing it, figuring out what their needs are. Um, a lot of these individuals have situations that they're going through that a lot of us don't understand. Um, that may be um, substance abuse, that may be mental disorder, that may be these. Those are how we need to address the issue, um, not citing them, not arresting them, not doing that, but figuring out how to fix the problem. And that's what our this officer will actually be addressing. We'll be hopefully be addressing them to where they can go to these um, facilities and maybe get more help that they need. That's huge. So I'm sorry, I can't. But, but we can talk about it here. So yeah, we can talk about it. But thank you. Uh, that's basically all I wanted to comment on. I think this is with this uh, this program that we got going on here with the family is going to be huge for the future. It's one piece of the puzzle that's going to be a much needed piece of the puzzle that's going to put things together where we can move forward as a city and actually hopefully be a, a guideline for some of the other cities to see if there's a positive way of handling the things that's not um, kicking the can down the road and that actually addressing the situation. That's what's happened in the past is we've kicked the can down the road too many times and it started back in the 80s during the Reagan administration where we shut down a lot of mental facilities. And because of that, we're we're addressing that issue now. And that's why we're looking at these issues that we should have been correcting years ago. So that's all I'll comment on. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Kay. Any other further comments or questions? Uh, I, I appreciate uh, Mr. White, your comments. I appreciate your comments, Mr. White, and I know you have both an educational law enforcement background, so I know you're well versed in this. Um, one of our, I think one of all law enforcement uh, concerns right now is, is who do you cite, who don't you cite? Do you, do you cite, do you cite and take in the rapist or do you cite and take in the jaywalker? Um, you know, we our jails are full. We had a uh, governor by the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger that started emptying of them, and then the subsequent governor continued to empty the prisons and put back in the jails so that we can have. Uh, you know, I, I see. Well, on my ride along, people go into um, the jail, and sometimes they're out before I I get out without the officer. Um, but we do want to, yeah, we want to make sure that we hold people accountable. Obviously. Um, I can tell you that in my five ride alongs that I've done, and I don't go out for two or three hours, I go out for 12 because the cops are out, the police officers are out for 12, so I like to see what they're doing. Um, I have seen no less than five or six checks on homeless, on fires, on garbage, on wellness checks on people laying around on the street. Uh, we didn't know whether they're homeless or not, just laying out in the middle of the street at three in the morning on, on the highway on Main Street, and the police officers stopped. So, um, I agree with you that all our white PD are homeless liaisons, but I, this program that um, uh, the, that the city has put together with the help of um, the county was, uh, it is a, a very good program. We hear get good feedback from homeless as well as other citizens. Um, nothing is going to solve the problem. Not, there's not one thing. It's going to be multiple things. I know San Diego spent eight million for a beautiful brand new uh, facility when Kevin Coffiner was there. I think Kevin did a, a miraculous job in San Diego. Of course, as you know, Coronado was an island that is attacked to San Diego. It's a very high rent area, and I look forward to reading about it because they, along with Las Vegas, Las Vegas has been held up as a model for, for homeless, what they're doing in the same thing with Seattle, what they're starting to do. So I look forward to reading about Coronado. I know San Diego last time I was there, I'm driving along the freeway, and people are sleeping on the side of the freeway, not on the other side of the fence, on the inside of the, on the, inside of the freeway. So I look forward to seeing it, and I always love Cornell. Um, but I will say that I, I, uh, in my, my final comment is that we have a code enforcement officer, and a code enforcement officer's job is not to go deal with homes, to deal with code enforcement on homes, safety, and fire. And, and um, I think, I believe that uh, the code enforcement officers who are meeting supervisors do a good job in, in making sure that code enforcement is focused on that. But it's always... Um, you know, it's always nice to have somebody, one person, like Officer Elliot, 
that can be focused directly on that and not have, you know, unless he have he gets a call for backup or something on something else, he can be out there kind of helping them out. I would really hope that we can find in any ways funding. I'm sorry, I can't have this session back and forth. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. White. I appreciate it. Good to see you as well. Any other? Councilman Baker, any questions or comments? No. Councilman Davis, any questions or comments? No, it, it, we're, we're not having a, another BG right to be officer, are we? If we're using the ones that we have and we're being reimbursed by the county of the $150,000. Is that correct? I'll just chime in uh, <laughs> somewhat. I mean, we we ultimately, Mr. Elliott is taking on this responsibility, has moved into um, a partial role. And so inevitably, we get many calls for the homeless population in the city of Wairica. And uh, most of the time, it's not the code enforcement officer, it's the uh, police department responding. And ultimately, we're trying to take a more active approach with this individual and bring him into the fold at behavioral health, understand what opportunities are available to try to get resources to this community. And inevitably, since YPD engages this population so much, we are then recouping $160,000 a year. So it just seems like a win win. Answer your question. So. Yeah, I, basically it's about um, community policing. I mean, he's already been doing it for a little while. I mean, he's built relationships with the individuals up on the hill and our in-house populations. Um, you know, they fill out cards. They the police know who they are up there. It's um, bringing more trust to the community to get them to get the help they need, and that's been missed for a long time. They have a great relationship. They respect him. I've heard good things about the community. He is working really well within this position, and we're lucky to have him and lucky to get the assistance from the assistance from the county. And it's really, really working. It's really working with the individuals and building a trust of respect and getting them the help they need. So it's a it's a very um, it's a win win for our city and uh, great for them to move forward in the next step of life and trying to get up there and getting the respect from an officer who respects them and not being afraid of the police because before you know there was you know i don't know they just always felt the disconnect i believe you know maybe that's not true maybe it is but um then one officer who they have a familiar face up there who is talking with them asking what they need you know he talked to me one day he went on his day off and bought the blankets, sleeping bag, warm clothes, food. You know, he's literally gone above and beyond to really get to know them. And so it's, um, he's a great officer for that position. And we're lucky that he stepped up to uh, do it. So, yes. I guess I'll have Mr. Kagan again. I don't know. We have nine minutes. Yes, <laughs> um, having officers like this is. It say actually saves the uh, city money because um, these officers like this are trained to deal with homeless people. So by having that, it actually uh, saves us money because we're not um, spending a lot of money for our other officers to go handle homeless situations. So if they're right, if this individual officer is able to handle a homeless situation, it frees our other officers to do their duty and other duties um, that they've been hired to do. So it actually pays money and hopefully we can get some more funding to address for the situations. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Another comments or questions. The reference to the action before you is motion to authorize city manager to sign a contract for the service agreement between the city and Susan County Health and Human Services Agency. What are the wishes of the council? I like hearing my motion so we Councilman K, motion. I'll start with this. And I have a second from Councilman Davis. I'll vote for roll call. Councilman Hay? Aye. Councilman Davis? Aye. Councilman Baker? Aye. Carlton McCoy? Aye. And Mayor Middleton? Aye. Great. Thank you, guys. All right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Point of order, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
Can we get some clarification from the city attorney that after the um, city council takes action on an item that it would be appropriate for the mayor to announce that the item has uh, passed or failed? So that it's very clear to the audience and those listening. Okay, I, don't, I think I can just do it. Just do it. So the motion passes for an item. Are you good now? <laughs> uh, nine eight. The motion passes with a five to zero vote in favor. All right. Thank you. Okay. Now we are at um, where are we at here? Oh, nine B. <laughs> nine B. I'm sorry. I gotta get it back here. Call on this. Nine B. So this is for the approval of right to city form for right to city council committees and commissioners to use for remote participation meeting notifications. Mr. Ledbetter. Yeah, if you'll recall uh, at the last meeting, we brought forth a the document within your agenda packet showing how we can move forward, allowing the continuance of these remote public meetings. Although tonight I'm kind of advocating that we do like Shasta County and keep it all in person uh, with the technical difficulties we're having. <laughs> but uh, ultimately, in order to allow city council members to continue to attend meetings remotely in case emergency happens, which we know that inevitably emergencies do happen, the document in your agenda packet, which you reviewed at the last meeting and seemed to have um, all agreed was an appropriate uh, um, form, we are looking for you to actually vote on tonight. So on February 21, 2023, the council was introduced to upcoming changes with respect to remote meetings, AD 2449 and the Brown Act. The bill further amends the Brown Act regarding remote teleconference participation in meetings of legislative bodies that are subject to the Brown Act by allowing individual members of legislative bodies increased flexibility to participate in meetings via teleconference in the event of a personal emergency without a declared state of emergency, provided that certain requirements are met. The form being reintroduced tonight would be used by city council members, committee members, and planning commissioners to notice the clerk of their remote attendance following these new guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ledbetter. Open up for public comment. No public comment. I'll come back to the city council for any questions or concerns. <laughs> My concern is our audio. I've been reading comments on our audio is just going in and out and freezing, and it's horrible here. <laughs> so if we do a remodel, I hope we really address the issue of getting a way better system of our microphone or audio system because I'm reading horrible notes on from our public about tonight's meeting about it freezing, not hearing us. So that's my comment. <laughs> Any other any other council members like to chime in? Council Baker. <laughs> so, uh, um, Mr. Ledbetter, I just have a question. Since this is going to be a council approved form, I am assuming that if there are, are changes to this form, it would need to come back to the city council um, for approval. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Actually, no, just a quick comment to what, what you're stating as far as our whole. Um, system we need to look into that that's what we need to i know mr mccoy brought up numerous times that we need to figure out a, a system here that's uh, suitable for the public and for us to give us something that uh, needs to be addressed yeah agreed thank you mr ledbetter okay we're at the council for uh for the council action is motion to approve the remote public meeting Form for notification of remote meeting attendance by city uh, council members, committee members, planning commissioners, pursuant to AB 2449 notification requirements of the motion from the council. Motion, so, so be as I'm stated. All right, I have a motion from Dwayne Cake. Somebody, okay. so, Councilor, Councilor McCoy, second. And a second by Pro Tim McCoy. Give a roll call. Aye. 
Thanks. Councilman Davis. Councilman Davis. Okay. We'll go back to um we've already did questions and public comments and I have a motion and a second we need to time in. Yeah, the motion we need to have a motion to the floor. Motion to the floor. I will vote no then. Okay, and no for Davis. Baker? Aye. Uh, Brenton McCoy? Aye. And I. No, tonight. We have uh, the motion passes with a nay from Councilman Davis. All right. See, this is the agenda title. This is approval of the real property sale to NorCal product by Pfeiffer Bacchio. Being Mr. Ledbetter, yeah. again? <laughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Marika City Council for Jason Ledbetter, the city manager. So the city of Marika and NorCal products, uh, now known as Pfeiffer, uh, have negotiated uh, into a purchase and sale agreement for real property identified as APN number 062-031-250-000. This property is essentially at the corner of 4H and Campus Drive over near COS and Viper. Uh, the buyer has agreed to purchase the land at its appraised value of $80,000. In April 2022, the City Council adopted Resolution 2022-11 declaring the land surplus in accordance with the surplus land back. Uh, the sale agreement would provide $80,000 to the city's assigned reserves that are designated to cover the cost of the uh, engineer and design for rainy park and pool, which we plan on going out to RFP by July 1st of this year. And so we would like the recommended action from staff as a motion to adopt resolution 2023-10 authorizing the city manager or his delegate to execute uh, the purchase and sale agreement between the city of Wairica and North Al Friday. Thank you, Mr. Lepner. Does have a comment regarding the sale of the partial to North Al products uh, by for vacuum for parcel number 0620031250. That's the corner of 4 h and Campus Drive. Any public comment regarding the sale of that property? No public comment? Okay, I will close public comment and I will go to council members for questions or comments. No questions or comments, council members? No questions or comments regarding so it's 9C. Questions or comments? I'm waiting. Do you have a question? <laughs> Okay, okay, no comments. Okay. All right, no comments. Okay, so the recommended city action, as Mr. Ledbetter uh, pointed out, is the motion to offer resolution, resolution 2310 authorizing the city manager to delegate to execute the purchase and sales agreement between the city of Barrica, North Cal Products Incorporated. I'll get um, the city council for their wishes. I move. I have a motion from uh, Councilman Davis. I'll second it. I have a second from Councilman Baker. I'll go to roll call. Councilman Kidd? Aye. Councilman Davis? Aye. Councilman Baker? Aye. Council or Pro Tim McCoy? Aye. And I, Mayor Middleton, uh, the motion passes by the zero to sell the property to North Cal Park by Verbacking. All right. Thank you. Okay. So this is invited. So Diamond T. Public works. Mr. Lebetter for work construction of the wastewater collection system improvements project presented to the city's clean water state revolving fund project numbers E 06 Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Wairica City Council. This is Jason Lebetter, city manager. Unfortunately, our director of public works. Um, had a somewhat of an emergency this afternoon, late afternoon, early evening, and had to run. So I let him know that I would cover this one, but we've discussed this um, over the course of the last year 
we have referred to it as the Burgess Street Sewer Project. And so basically, we are looking for uh, the, the Council Adopt Resolution 2023 the construction contract to site work solutions Inc. for the wastewater collection system improvements project in the amount of six million one hundred and four thousand six hundred and twenty seven dollars for the base bid and to execute related documents uh, we also will have our attorney review these documents before we um, enter into contract so on february 23 2023 bids were open for the wastewater collection system improvements project that we have referred to as the burgess street project uh, the results of the bid opening are within your agenda worksheet or within your memo and agenda. Uh, this project involves installing approximately 17,000 linear feet of sewer piping, uh, just over 1,000 linear feet of water piping, 34 new manholes, 215 two way cleanouts, 22 back check valves, two fire hydrants, and 105,000 square feet of chip seal for street restoration concentrated in the Burgess Street and Court Street uh, neighborhood. Uh, the work will be done in several areas around the city, including Burgess Street, 3rd Street, Yama Street, North Street, Knapp Street, among others. Uh, city staff and case engineering have evaluated the bidder's license status, bid bond, and insurance company information and have confirmed that the bidder is not debarred from working on projects in California. Staff finds the bid is responsive and the bidder is responsible. The bid amount is reasonable given the current cost of labor and materials. It is recommended pending the city attorney approval that the city council approve the attached resolution to authorize the city manager to award a construction contract and ex execute various agreements for the construction of this project. Uh, the fiscal impact here is an award of $6,104,627. Um, in a construction grant in the amount of uh, $5.5 million with no match required. So hopefully, as we ponder this here tonight, we celebrate the fact that we are going to do a gigantic project for next to nothing, no cost next to the city, other, other than the little bit of the enterprise fund cover from the 5.5 million to bring us up to 6 million. So this is one of many good projects that we have scheduled for this summer. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ledbetter. I will go to public comment. <clears throat> Any public comment regarding I'm coming, it's a long way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna hold your plane. <laughs> Full service, I feel like it's missed there. Thank you. And ironically, I even had some of the because I live by the creek, I have had some of the homeless people walk by and say, This is the worst street in the city. <laughs> so we're well, really happy that it's going to be correctly moving. So thank you so much. Any other public comment? Yeah. Uh, Learn some love. Uh, if you have uh, a map of the affected areas in the water bill, so people know if. If this actually affects that, all the comments are fine. Fine. Yeah, I can address that. Absolutely, we can. We generally um, have provided similar information like that. And I will make a note um, that upon approval, we can start to advertise in the newsletter some of the engineer design plans and kind of a summary. So that the community is aware of the multitude of projects that are happening that are maybe state projects and then some that are going to be city projects as well, because we will be bringing back uh, Southern Oregon for this summer as well. Thank you, Mr. Rector. Any other public comment? All right, I will close the public comment and go to the city council for any questions or comments. 
Councilman Baker. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lebeck, um, how is the how are these projects chosen? These projects are generally chosen. Uh, that's a great question. So first of all, I just want to say that that is an excellent question. I want you want the city council to think about uh, what I'm about to say because you guys are going through a planning exercise called the general plan. And technically, that is our strategic plan. And we also have a multitude of what we call master plans that exist within water and wastewater. And those are updated uh, every X years as well. And so ultimately, what you saw on Highway 3, that was in both water and wastewater master plans. Plan documents that uh, I believe East Engineering helps us uh, articulate. And so my understanding is that the need was identified uh, many years ago within the sewer master plan. Thank you. Great. Councilman Baker, thank you. And I'm sorry, I just got to just kind of compound on that. And the reason I mentioned that is because I think for a lot of people, government seems to move very, very slowly. And documents get approved, and people say, "Well, that doesn't mean anything. No one, nothing's ever going to come of that document." But that is why the general plan is so important. It is because we are making statements of the housing element that we are committed to moving in a very specified direction, and that technically, if it's not in our master plan. It can be contested by members of the community because we had not planned to do one of these projects. And so the planning phase is so important in government because if you plan correctly, you save a lot of money on the back end when you, when you do these large projects. So that's my two cents. And if I'm, if I'm correct, I could be wrong. But the neighborhood over on Dexter probably hasn't had our sewer updated since they moved all those houses from the freeway over. A lot of those houses were moved over when they made the freeway. So it's probably had that same sewer. And yeah, it's been neglected for a little while. So I know the residents over there are very happy there to get some improvements. So very happy because we've been in letters for years. I think even before, even before I took my seat here, I remember I was sharing some letters from previous years uh, because they felt very left out. So I'm very excited for um, these neighborhoods and our residents in the North End. Mr. Mayor, if I might, just to continue to here tonight when we talk about this project, that's a great point. We, the city, has gotten letters for multiple years not about the sewer, but about the road. And so ultimately, unfortunately, this project will not create, uh, it will not, you know, create sidewalks because uh, of exactly what you just said, that things were moved. And so inevitably we have a road that continues to crumble. And so this project, with the help of the assistant city manager, the public works director, and going back to our engineering staff and basically stating, look, the road is in such disrepair that when we cut into it, we don't want to come back later on and do partially fixing the road. If we're already going to cut the road up, let's fix the entire thing over there. So that is the intent to fix as much road as possible. And uh, we were able to pull that off with this funding. So, Great. Do you have a question or comment? I'm going to yield when you find out. Okay. Please. Any other questions or comments? Council? Quick call. Yeah. yeah the, this the, the letters we received, uh, I'm just going to be veritable contest to it, but we've gotten that for the last probably uh, six or eight years, I would say. It's been going on for more than 10 years. Yeah. So to be able to at least get some of this repaired to the sewer system and all that, then it's, uh, that's a double win on that one. We're going to actually get uh, the old citizens and get some stuff fixed. So. That's all on that. Great. Okay, so I'll close comment and then um, the record of the city council action before you is the motion to adopt a resolution 2023 20, 11 authorizing the city manager to award a construction contract to Site Work Solutions Incorporated for the wastewater collection system improvements project in the amount of $6,104,627 for the base bid and to execute the related documents and of course the project is subject to review and approval of our city attorney.
What are the wishes of the council? This is Councilman McCoy. Uh, so moved. I have a motion from Pro Tem Councilman McCoy. I'll be waiting second. And I have a second from Councilman McCoy. Uh, or, sorry. Oh, okay. I will uh, go for <laughs> roll call. Uh, Councilman K. Aye. Councilman Davis. Aye. Councilman Baker. Aye. Uh, Pro Tem McCoy. Aye. And there was an aye. The motion passes. Congratulations, you have to break. Yeah, it's a big win. I share, share the excitement of the residents okay. and our, our city manager for sure. Okay, so we are going to, this is um, 10B. This is the port of legislation to revise the boundaries of the Sierra Nevada uh, Conservancy region to include all areas and watersheds of Sipu and Modoc counties. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Warwick City Council. This is Jason Leather, the city manager. Uh, so I am here before you today to talk about an item that was brought to me by Laurel Harkness from GoBiz. She is a resident of the Mount Shasta area, and she worked with uh, Sydney County as well as Modoc County to basically adopt legislation from Brian Daly that he has to. Uh, Increase the footprint of the Sierra Nevada, Nevada Conservancy region, which ultimately opens up a large pot of money to invest in different projects within uh, the health of the forest here. And so I just want the council to be aware that the county of Sitview adopted the same resolution, and so did Modoc County. And I spoke with Supervisor Ogren earlier today. And she was going to attend a different function this evening, but ultimately advocated that they, the city county was in broad support of what you have here uh, before you today. So uh, I'll just go ahead and read this memo. So California forests and watersheds are a critical point or at a critical point, ongoing drought, tree mortality, low snowpack, and a century of fire suppression have led to an increase in large high severity wildfires. This measure will expand the region of the Sierra Nevada Conservancy to add the upper watershed areas of the Klamath River in Siskiyou County and Modoc County. This area is of critical natural and cultural value to the state of California. The Sierra Nevada Conservancy can service the new areas by increasing the pace and scale of forest restoration through its Watershed Improvement Program, otherwise known as WIT, a crucial program to ensure the resilience of the natural resources of these watersheds in the communities that depend on them. The Sierra Nevada Conservancy was created by bipartisan legislation and signed into California law in 2004. The Sierra Nevada Conservancy was created with the understanding that the environmental, economic, and social well-being of the Sierra Nevada slash Cascade region and its communities are closely linked, and that the region and the state of California would benefit from an organization providing a strategic direction. In the original legislation, the definition of the region was established to include areas lying within 22 counties of California, including the counties of Alpine, Amador, Butte, Calaveras, El Dorado, Fresno, Inyo, Kern, Lassen, Madera, Mariposa, Modoc, Mono, Nevada, Placer, Plumas, Shasta, Sierra, Tehama, Tulare, Duwamie, and Yuba. In 2021, SB 208, presented by Daly, added areas within the counties of Sipiu and Trinity to the region. Senator Daly introduced SB 841 last week. The bill would change the boundary of the Sierra Nevada Conservancy region to include all of Sipiu and Modoc counties. The modification will add the upper watershed area of the Klamath River in both Sipiu County and Modoc County to the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. SB 841 will remove capacity barriers and provide both Sipiu County and Modoc County and all eligible entities and tribes within the region more equitable access to state resources through the Sierra Nevada Conservancy for countywide and regional planning and implementation of critical watershed improvements, cross-jurisdictional collaboration, establishment of co-stewardship plans with tribes, preservation of working landscapes, wildfire risk reduction, 
growth of the regional stewardship economy, increased outdoor recreation access and opportunity in the region, protection, conservation, and restoration, the region's physical, cultural, archaeological, historical, and living resources. So you can see why this is such a bipartisan uh, conservancy, why there's people on both sides of the uh, of the aisles that support this. So essentially, we're asking for the recommended action. A motion to adopt resolution 2023-12 of the City Council of the City of Wailika supporting state legislation to revise the boundaries of the Sierra Nevada Conservancy region to include all areas and watersheds of Fiskew and Modoc County. Thank you, Senator. I'll open up to public comment. Debbie Beard, I just need a little clarification as to whether or not these public lands that are um, being relinquished to the conservancy, does that imply or mean that we will no, the public will no longer have control over this through county? These are county properties, correct? And then the second question is, once it has been relinquished to properties, acreage, whatever has been relinquished to the conservancy, does that mean that the control um, of usage from the public is going to be regulated by them? What what are we losing with all the uh, wonderful things that are offering us? Thank you. Right, thank you. Any other public comments? Yeah, I can attempt to, and ultimately, unfortunately, uh, I'm unsure of really the answers here. Uh, I'm not, I'm not quite understanding the question completely. I don't think there's a relinquishing of land. It's like a boundary, kind of an arbitrary boundary that says this is the few county. So this is uh, another location, and this is just an extension of that. Uh, you can see the current boundary <clears throat> is in your packet. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately it includes, I mean, essentially from Bakersfield uh, currently all the way up into the Lassen National Forest. And I guess also the Chef, the National Forest as well. So. If there is a point of contention and you guys would like more information, I can certainly reach out to Brian Dowling's office to engage this conversation, but I am definitely not the, uh, uh, I did not uh, create this bill that's being presented by Mr. Dowling. Uh, we're just bringing it forward because we have some members in the community, including the five supervisors for the board versus Butte County that support this document. And ultimately, it makes no difference uh, to my life if you approve or disapprove this. Uh, <laughs> it, it really is no, Wairika is not on the hook for anything here. It is literally just being as a supporting member next to Siskiyou County and Modoc County and a number of other cities that have already passed this resolution and supporting Brian Daly's effort to add this territory. Okay, I will close public comment and go to city council. Council members, any questions or concerns? Yeah. Mr. McCoy? Councilor McCoy, if I might, um, I just want to address it. So it's a good question that uh, uh, Debbie asked, Debbie Barrett asked. Um, basically, what this allows for, I think it's just for, again, I don't think it does anything. Jurisdictionally, you don't give up any land at all. What it does is that if you're in the conservancy, then you have you have the ability to get cross jurisdictional collaboration established. In other words, you can. Um, you can, uh, it says it's supposed to help increase our outdoor access. We can get money or resources, but like, let's just call it, it's money, it's tax dollars, in order to help with uh, wildfire reduction and mitigation, 
um, growth of, of uh, the regional economy, increased outdoor access and opportunity for people that are coming to the region or for us here, and then conservation and restoration, which is what, I mean, uh, again, I'm not from a logging family, from a farming family. Um, if we don't conserve our land, uh, we only farm up one or two or three years and then we're bankrupt. And I think loggers and um, that the, do the timber harness up here, I think they are the, the greatest example of conservationists. And I, I think they would probably say, yeah, we could have a bit more help in some of the, whether it's private land or whether it's public land, you know, reforming and things like that. I, I think they would probably support that. And then it just talks about restoring physical, cultural, archaeological, historical, living resources. And I, and I think that that's um, something that we, we should embrace here because we're in a very uh, physically uh, beautiful place, uh, culturally and archaeologically, historically, it's very, very rich. So I don't, again, from what I've read of this and seen, um, I, I don't think it's a land grab, you're trying to control it. You know, not like past people who have gone out and just locked the gates of the forest of the streets. So thank you for your question. Thank you, Councilman McCoy. Any other questions or concerns? Um, so I have done a little bit of research on this, but have not been able to like digest all of the information. Um, uh, Mr. Ledbetter, would you have any examples of projects that um, this organization has completed in other counties? Unfortunately, I do not have much information on this item. I could certainly, if it is at the interest of the city council, ultimately, if you guys um, don't want to move forward with this, it's completely fine. And if we can abandon it, or if you want to bring it back, what I would do based off of your inquiries that you have is I would probably get a representative from either Galley's office or the Conservancy. To engage the meeting to be able to answer these questions because I don't have um, I don't feel comfortable telling you yes or no on some of this stuff and I'm not I'm not that familiar. Thank you. Actually, I I would prefer that I'm not ready to vote on this tonight. Okay. Is the wishes of the council a uh, direction to um, bring this item back for discussion with um, representative from Dolly's office or the oh, <laughs> sorry. The water, the conservative, the watershed. Point, point of order. Um, we don't need, uh, I think, uh, Councilwoman uh, Baker, if I'm correct, from what uh, Attorney Henry said, she doesn't need our permission to pull something off of the agenda. Well, I love the ASA. So that was the item then. Can we have a ruling on that, uh, Attorney Henry? Attorney Henning, are you there? She's she's got on right now. She's got dialing. She's got dialing on the bird. That's a pause. Hold on. I think you're just bringing it. Attorney Henning. Uh, okay, are you ready? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, the um, situation, situation with the con consent agenda is entirely, entirely different than pulling the matter from, from the city council agenda, agenda for a later review. review. That, that would that that, that, that is something, something that, that would take, take the consensus of council. council. Okay. Attorney okay. Henning, is it a consensus or is it a vote? Well, you could do either. I, I mean, a consensus would definitely work. work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, it's a consensus and agreement um, to bring this item back so we can have further clarification. I'm good with it. Yeah, bring it back. I'm okay with it to bring it back. Mr. Davis, is it to bring the item back? We yeah, have representatives. Okay. Okay. I'm going to help. So, it's a routine item. It's on the hill. Okay. So, consensus is important. We'll call you. We'll call you. Okay. With representation or representative from the company or, or Dolly. I'm sorry, Mayor. We ask you first back as an informational item uh, from this. 
Excuse me. Uh, sorry for interrupting you, Mr. Mayor. Are we asking it, Mrs. Councilman McCoy? Are we asking for it to come back strictly as an informational item? Or are we asking it for it to come back as information as well as a vote? I would like to uh, come back to the vote, but with representatives explaining to us what questions from the public and the council, then we can vote which whatever the council wishes to vote at that time. But the information provided from the representatives. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, we got that, Mr. Ledbetter. All right. Yes, Thank you. <laughs> All right, so moving on. Uh, this is item C. This is authorizing a grant application to Cal, uh, Cal Recycle through the Joint Powers Agreement as the Siski County Integrated Solid Waste Management Regional, Regional Agency. Mr. Ledbetter. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor and the Marika City Council. This is Jason Ledbetter, the city manager. So uh, we have a recommended motion here tonight on this item. Adopt resolution 2023-13 of the City Council of the City of Marika. Authorizing submittal of application for payment programs uh, and related authorizations for waste tire amnesty grant. So essentially, as part of a joint powers agreement, uh, the nine incorporated cities work with the city of county on solid waste items and the county applies generally on behalf of not only themselves, but of those cities. There's only one city I'm aware of that once in a while will take certain items off the plate and handle themselves internally. And that is the city of Thule Lake based off of their location. And so inevitably, our participation in, an, uh, in a grant like this in the past, what it does is it frees up extra money for the county to run certain programs. In this instance, this is for tire amnesty. And so the county will take this money and they will do events at, generally speaking, the Oberlin Transfer Station, where there will be multiple free days for the uh, public all over the county to take tires for free and dump them off and the grant money pays for that event to happen. They'll do the same down in Blackfield, but our participation would infer that ultimately they would be running one of these events as they normally do throughout the year, and they would continue to do it at the Overland Transfer Station. Thank you, Mr. Lebanon. I'll open up the item for public comment. Any public comment? No. Okay. I will open up to, to the city council for any questions or public comment. Questions or comments, city council? No. Okay. Then I will go to the um, floor. So the recommended city council action is a motion to approve resolution 2023-13 of the city council of the city of Barbie authorizing submittal of the application for payment. Programs and related to authorization for waste, fire, and the C grant. What are the wishes of the council? So moved. I have a motion from Councilman Baker. I'll second. And a second from Councilman Davis. Roll call. Councilman Gay? Aye. Councilman Davis? Aye. Councilman Baker? Aye. Pro Tim McCoy? Aye. And ayes uh, Mayor Middleton. So the motion passes. Okay. Well, we are down to D. <laughs> this is for the grant application for Cal Fire, California Climate Investments, Welfare Prevention Grants Program. Mr. Leather. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and Wairica City Council. Jason Leather, the city manager here. Uh, so ultimately, if you'll recall, there was a few months back an OES grant opportunity for a resiliency officer. We scrambled and were able to, with the, really the guidance of the assistant city manager, really put together what we think is a very competitive package that would ultimately lead to a mil, uh, is it a, roughly a million dollars that would allow us to employ someone for five years that would be seeking to apply for grants such as the one that we have in front of you. But I just want to make sure everyone is aware. We've heard from, we hear constantly from a multitude of members of the community. There's obviously uh, 
a number of things that need to be looked at within the city of Wairika. We are actively seeking to solve multiple problems in the city of Wairika revolving around water, housing, homeless, and fire. And ultimately, even though we do not have this grant position currently in house, our assistant city manager is not going to let an opportunity like this Cal Fire grant pass us by. You're not going to wait until we possibly get somebody in house to continue to apply for these items just coming off the heels of the McKinney fire. So, what you have in front of you today is we worked with the Wairika Fire State Council, George James, Jay Perkins. We also worked with Bernie Paul, the South Wairika Fire Chief. To kind of discuss what our capacity was, what the needs of the community were, and what the other agencies were applying for on this grant opportunity, and how we could fit into all of that. And so we came up with a $2.5 million opportunity. And the project budget is equipment, procure an air curtain burner for fuel disposal. So an air curtain burner essentially looks like a shipping container and ultimately is supposed to not let off some of the very negative um, hazardous waste that will go into the air when these fires occur or when you're trying to burn off fuel. And so a lot of these grants require you to either chip or send your um, waste to a co-generation plant. And so that's an obstacle for a lot of people. And so we are advocating to get the first air curtain burner in the area, which would be utilized by a multitude of folks on bigger projects. If the Forest Service was doing a project on their land, we would work with them to possibly utilize this air curtain burner that would be on city property. And ultimately, as uh, Wyoming to Fire City Council has done, uh, with the craggy project and all the defensible space that they've uh, set up for us around um, the sphere of influence, projects like that could be utilized. We could utilize this air curtain. Also, a skid steer um, and then mastication, a mastication head that would go on the skid steer. And so, ultimately, what we would be able to do with that is enter into, you know, with either future grants or on our own property. The greenway comes up quite a bit. We know that we have a shelter that hopefully will be open in the next two to three months. We know that we are confined by Martin versus Boise, but we have a critical infrastructure ordinance. And so our hope is we have beds available. We're talking about a home key option and ultimately a level of enforcement by asking folks to enter into one of these future facilities, thereby freeing up the area and being able to masticate along the greenway, being able to masticate on our own property and then work with property owners on say Butcher Hill, Alton, Deer Creek and do mastication projects with our own equipment is pretty vital to keep us safe. And so we're advocating for the purpose for the purchase of a skid steer, masticating head and an ex excavator. We're also advocating within this grant application for staffing to cover public works crews members and mechanics to operate and maintain the equipment. The city is uniquely qualified to house, maintain, and operate this equipment with depth of trained equipment operators, class day drivers, and highly skilled mechanics. Pardon me. And then collaboration and contract services. So for larger fuel reduction work, the city will seek contract services for specific public, tribal, and private lands. Focused initially in this project on the Interstate 5 corridor, inside city limits with the city's zip code, so the sphere of influence and radius uh, for fuel reductions um, through January of 2029. And the grant provides for a 12% indirect cost recovery for grant administration. And so right now we feel comfortable applying for exactly what this project looks like in the hopes that we then also get our OES grant and we have a resiliency officer who then can step up our game and actually start doing prescription work on multiple properties, whether they be public or private within the city limits of Wairica. Thank you, Mr. Larkin. Is there any public comment? Just a quick comment. Uh, I utilize uh, the Greenhorn Park extensively 
And I'm on the trails almost every day. And the buildup of fuels on those trails has become rather significant. Uh, has there been any discussion on ways to access those trails in a non damaging way to remove those uh, excess fuels and stack? Uh, they've they done a great job of knocking things out of stacking it. Are there ways to utilize some of the things you're looking at there to reduce that uh, mass of uh, buildup? Before we have a real problem. That's my comment. Thank you. Any other public comments? Okay, no, I will close public comments and then want to address that question. Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. And ultimately, it's a kind of twofold situation. We are very lucky to have such a relationship with the Cal Fire CISPU unit who has. Uh, helped us quite a bit and continues to help us quite a bit within Greenhorn. But yes, uh, this is exactly some of this equipment, especially the mastication equipment, uh, ultimately. And then if we are not comfortable with any type of piling that we do, which we really at this point shouldn't be, you know, unfortunately, I mean, unless Cal Fire and, and our chief is present, obviously, the duties prescribed burns on slat files that ultimately, yes, we would have an air curtain and we would be able to transport that waste down to the air curtain and burn safely. Thank you, Mr. Lecker. Over to the city council for open up for questions. Mr. Davis, question? Um, I got three. I'm going to start out with a statement. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I went to that fire state council first time, and we were talking about this application tool and you know this keeps here. I'm going, well, where are we getting those? And then all of a sudden, I read my back and by golly, there they are. <laughs> and at these gentlemen, Forest Service, Cal Fire, South Fire region, and our uh, chief here, are pretty darn excited about this stuff. They, they see some real advantages. To our community, you know, and then you're talking about the Greenway and the Interstate 5 corridor. Yeah, those all need a lot of help. It's pretty obvious when you go up or drive by. Um, I, I'm really thinking this is a positive thing for our community, and I hope to see you go forward. Thank you, Councilman Davis. Any other questions or comments? City Council? No? Okay. Of those public comments of the motion before you is the motion for resolution 2023-14 of the Rec City Council of the City of Arriga approving the building of the application for the California Climate Investment Wildfire Prevention Grants Program. What are the wishes of the council? Um, Councilman Davis, I have a motion. Uh, I'll just bring Kate a second. Okay. Councilman Jay is the second. Roll call. Councilman Kate? Aye. Councilman Davis? Aye. Councilman Baker? Aye. Croton McCoy? Aye. And I, uh, Mayor Middleton? <laughs> Motion passes. Great. Thank you, everybody. And then now we will go on to city manager and staff reports. Mr. Ledbetter? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Wire Richard City Council, Kate Lever, City Manager. Thanks for the real brief report. Uh, number one here, the uh, finance department is having their first round of budget hearing meetings with all the departments. So we've started that process and ultimately we'll be bringing you a budget when we're completing that process. Uh, still a long way to go, but the process has started. Um, on 321, staff will be bringing the affordable housing site inventory report to council to get direction on possible future developments. Uh, a letter to each property owner of the 12 sites analyzed is being sent out this week to determine if any property owner is interested in partnering on possible housing in the city that could be grant funded. So the prior council, I believe, 
uh, basically gave authority for us to enter into a contract with a consulting firm called Housing Tools. And they did this work of the affordable housing site inventory as part of that contract. They analyzed 12 sites. Uh, they're privately owned. And now we are going to engage those property owners to see if they have an interest in essentially partnering, which could mean they maintain the property or they would sell it to a developer that we would be teaming up with. So, pardon me. <clears throat> Number three here is that the request for qualifications or the RFQ for master developers has gone out from housing tools. And we will be, we are interested to see if we have some developers to put on our list of partners that, they, that we may eventually be teaming up with, or we would then team them up with property owners that I just mentioned above. And so, the meeting on the 21st will be very interesting because you will have an opportunity to take a look at that analysis and then you will be guiding us as to which sites make the most sense that you want to continue to flesh out to see a possible um, a project that would consist of housing units and you have the missing middle book that you have uh, been hopefully taking a look at but have a multitude of different opportunities we are very infatuated with cottage cluster style housing, which looks like the Hollywood on the low. Uh, I attended a local city manager meeting with city managers from Dunsmere, Mount Shasta, and Weed on 3123. And we are hoping to make this kind of a monthly um, meeting. And then the Southern Oregon city managers meeting, uh, they took a hiatus as uh, Chris Clayton had surgery and he is back. And so those monthly meetings are up again and more than likely will attend the 327 meeting. And just for, I know everybody is aware, um, I just wanna thank Chief Gilman. I wanna thank the entire council, specifically council member McCoy for working the warning center that will be at the Methodist church. The ship starts at 1 15 after this meeting uh, and we will also be participating in the warning center on 3-8 as well so that's all I have folks thank you thank you Mr. Leather I will go to um, council members for any other uh, council members here first any okay. reports questions concerns uh, yes yeah. Uh, so, Mr. Ledbetter, um, the housing, uh, I'm sorry, you mentioned it in your report, and I, I don't have the exact name of it. The, the um, inventory, site inventory. Is there any kind of deadline that's attached to us making a decision about that? There's no deadline, definitely. Technically, there's really no deadline other than supernovas and the money uh, available. Um, and really the appetite for housing, I guess I will say that ultimately, you know, I'm just going to say this, I'm the city manager for the city of Water Rica, and ultimately uh, I can do a number of things and I guarantee you that I will not make everybody happy. And what my goal is here, and I stand by this, and I don't think I would be welcoming a lot of communities as a city manager, my goal is to raise everybody up. And I know that that's not necessarily, and I'm not saying anything to you, council, any council member here, but I know that that's a tough one to swallow because I believe that by raising everybody up, we all win. The person that has a lot of money then doesn't need to see a dilapidated property or they don't need to see people living in their own feces on the side of the hill by campus drive and so I would basically just ask this of the city council. You have given me a review. And within that review, you have stipulated to me that you want me to solve the housing crisis in the city of Wairika. And by golly, I'm going to do it. <laughs> but I need your help. And ultimately, in the face of great difficulty, great things can happen. Ball Creek was one of those things that transpired here. This was a visionary town for a long time. 
people went and sought electricity somewhere else and brought it into the city of Wairika. That was a great change. People left the Greenhorn Reservoir and we went to Fall Creek and we brought the water and that was a great change. And ultimately we have a vacancy rate of 1.3%. So I guess my answer to your question is, is that that is the, that is the, that is what we're up against. That ultimately a vacancy rate of 1.3% and expanding fiber economy or job opportunities. And ultimately we are trying to solve a problem that the state will fund at the moment. And so I am advocating that we continue to move forward. I realized I was in Carl's bag during the housing element discussion, which I know was a very raucous discussion, uh, but ultimately, if we don't want to do housing, I disagree with that. I think we should do housing, but I am completely fine not doing housing. And so I guess my point is, is that I don't want to single you out here, but if you're already asking me, do you I need to make a decision on this? And we haven't even gotten to the meeting. It's just a little concerning to me because ultimately I am under the impression that I am being reviewed on bringing housing to the city of Wairika. And so I am advocating to do that. And I know that change is difficult for people. And so ultimately, technically, there's no deadline on anything, really. I mean, we could have just not passed the housing element. And we could have been just like uh, another city in Southern California, Huntington Beach, who ultimately more than likely will see an impact. We probably wouldn't have seen an impact because developers aren't lining up to get beachfront property in the city of Wairika, thereby bypassing all of our local laws, which is why there was a deadline for passing that. And so I guess that I'm sorry that this is maybe a little bit kind of uh, coming across in any level of negative way. But to me, it's very important that we solve this issue. We do not solve homelessness without solving housing. We do not solve fixing our sidewalks without fixing the housing crisis. Everything, in my opinion, revolves around fixing the housing crisis. And, and I have a staff who is staying late, coming in early, working weekends, working consistently to bring projects forward this being one of them, but ultimately, I just need the city council to believe me. That's really all I, I need the five of you to believe that I want to fix the city of Wairika. And I guarantee you that not everyone that sat in my seat felt that way. And I guarantee you that not everyone that sits in my seat at a number of cities around the state of California feels that way and feels passionately about fixing the community they live in, and I said this the last time I went before you guys came on with the last city council, at the city manager meeting in Monterey a year ago, it was very clear to me that a large percentage of city managers are content changing jobs every three to five years, because ultimately they can just beat you in line for three to five years until you get wise, and then they go take another position somewhere else. And so this is organically coming out of me right now, but I just want you guys to know that ultimately I would not advocate to do anything that was, in my eyes, detrimental to the community that I have chosen to raise my family in. And when it comes to housing, I know that there's a conflicted view with a vocal minority within the community, and I just happen to disagree with that. And if the council disagrees with me, that's totally fine. But I would rather know that than just spin around in circles and not supply the city council with a directive to resolve the issue, if that makes any sense. So I'm sorry. To but maybe that. I feel like I've been chastised. Uh, and uh, the reason that I asked that question is because that's something that I think that the city we hear as a council, and I'm sure that I, I'm going to speak for myself, but I'm sure that I'm not the only person on this council that hears this is that it, change is definitely scary to everybody. And when we are discussing huge items like housing and we're told that there is a, a deadline that we need to meet um, and um, I guess another way of saying this 
is I want to make sure that with this process, uh, the public is afforded a lot of time and opportunity to really digest this report and to take a look at it. Um, so, I mean, because we're working for the citizens of Irica, and I just want to say that I have the utmost faith in you. I, my question was not meant as any kind of criticism. I just want to make sure that we're going to be giving, through this process, citizens the opportunity to comment on it, and regardless of what the point of view is. So. Well, I did mean to chastise you, but I do want to make it clear that ultimately um, my intentions are pure, I guess, is, is my take, and that ultimately, is, however long it takes to digest this document, is up to the city council. Councilman Baker, Davis. I kind of believe that we have accepted a housing element uh, in a pretty strong way. It was a it was substantial victory for the housing element, and and Mr. Ledbetter is doing exactly what we're asking him to do. He's going to go find some properties, and maybe he's going to find some developers, and and I admire him for that. I didn't support that program, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't. But he's doing his job, and you, you've given him that direction. And so to go to it, Mr. Ledbetter, I'll be right there with you trying to find the right people for the job. Can I make another comment? I really did not mean to come across, Mr. Ledbetter, that I was not trusting you or did not have faith in your ability to do the job that we've asked you to do. So if I came across that way, I would like to apologize. You absolutely did not come across that way. And I, I just want to make sure that I have a lot of respect for you and we have great, wonderful meetings. And ultimately I feel like uh, we have a, we're headed in a very positive direction. And so ultimately my commentary is more of just the conversation because I did miss the housing element meeting in person. And ultimately I understand what the city council is inevitably up against in, in every city in the state of California. And I just do find that it is very fascinating. Um, somebody pointed this out to me recently that ultimately everybody really likes the history of mining and everybody really likes the history of minor streets. And when you look at that, time period, that is not generally what people advocate for. Uh, they advocate for uh, post-World War II suburbia. And so the city of Wairica is actually kind of a dichotomy, right? Because really the history of the city is minor street that acted just like any other very urban area where you had a lot of densely housing and you had retail shops with people living above those areas and we all love that we love the way it makes us feel and so ultimately we also have this thing that other people really love from the 60s or the 50s which is more of the suburban sprawl and the larger lots and um, I understand people love that too and ultimately I understand that this issue uh, brings out a lot of um, enthusiasm and so I just want you to know, I have, my comments were not directed necessarily towards you, Ms. Baker, in any way. I have a lot of respect for you, but that ultimately, I would love to solve the issue of housing for the community, and we've taken a lot of steps, and I just really want to see um, action, ultimately, uh, because I do believe that that's what this community needs to thrive again. So, just to be clear, I have no ill will towards you whatsoever. I'd love to talk to you on Friday afternoons. And so if it came across in a negative way, uh, I apologize. So I actually do have just one more question. All right. And that is, you mentioned that the, um, the contractor that we have that is sending out um, this information and the letters to the property owners. And they're also, it's my understanding from what you said, um, put together a list of master developers, and I'm assuming that they reach out um, <coughs> to ask people if they want to be on that list, the developers. 
and my question is, uh, I don't want to be under the wrong assumption. Um, that will include local developers as well as corporations. <laughs> it's a request for qualifications. And so inevitably it would just fall into if we have um, somebody that met the qualifications of that level of uh, development. But we've also, since your guys' meeting over the housing element, we've had a large influx of interest of local developers that aren't interested in grant opportunities, but are interested in development. And I think we're kind of sitting back to see what the pulse of the city was. And so we're working with them as well to answer their questions. I'm not sure. I think there's some local ties to what would be considered kind of these larger development companies, um, but I'm not sure if, um, if there is someone local that kind of fits that mold, but they are welcome to um, basically apply to get on that list. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. On to we're just going to call it. So, well, I'll help you back. Council's been saving comments on it. So, then we had our COC meeting. We did approve um, some funding for the FMU to come and assist you to apply for a $273,000 grant um, for that. So, that was something that's going to benefit them. If anybody knows about yes. Uh, you can power assist you that are really a, a good outlet out there that actually serves the community the youth up to 24 years old. So if um yeah, I know of anybody that's struggling that's under 24, you know, send them send them that direction. They have a lot of um Sarah Springfield has actually developed helped develop this program, yes, and it's really going into a really big, really big deal is they help with housing and any type of support system for the youth. It's really been working out great. She's doing a great job on that. Um, so I was going to find what we did on that. Um, other than that, we just a lot of information that we did shared during our COC meeting. Um, we haven't still got back the numbers for the like, time count yet, some finding numbers yet. So um, as soon as we get that, I'll share that with everybody. But other than that, I'm mean, going oh, yeah. to Thank you. Thank you. What's it been? time fun. So um, I, I want to agree with uh, Mr. Baker that Governor, I don't know if you said it or you, government is slow by nature. I mean, you know, having been in education for 30 years and working with the state and the feds, it was always slow. I, I put a picture on Facebook of the um, minor that Ralph Sarah did and the ore cart or the mule, excuse me, that's at the, when you come into town with the old sign that uh, John Mercier redid and the LEDs and it hung right there by Wyoming Drive by Little White Meat. And it was interesting. And I said, you know, uh, uh, come visit us, the best kept secret in Northern California. And I got lots and lots of positives, um, which is wonderful because we want to be positive about our community. The only two negatives I got were A, homeless, and B, business. Well, business we want to drive business here and i think we're trying to do it as a council the five of us and we've got this uh city that's working hard behind the staff in order to drive business the housing is important because you know as i talked to well we tried to again i'll go back we tried to hire two city managers and housing was an issue it was an issue for an interim city manager to become here and work with us i mean we know that that was a topic um the other thing for the homeless is that at, at some point in time we it, it, it's not the end all for homelessness. There's always going to be homelessness, but we'd like to minimize it and we'd like to give the homeless the opportunity. And so um, one of the things that concerns me, and I'm going to be very honest with you and all the council members, is that what I hear in this community is that this council is taking away our rights of our citizens. We're taking away the rights of the citizens to have an R1 house by putting an apartment complex right next to them. Now, I don't have any going up next to my house. I don't know if any of you have any R1 complexes going up. I mean, any uh, multi-unit complexes going up, like big high-rises of two or three um, stories. But um, 
I, 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 I'm I going to agree with Greg Davis in that we've, we've asked you to do the housing, and that's what we that's what I want. But we asked you to do that. But I wish that somehow through our maybe through our new ad hoc communication committee with you and 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 Councilwoman Baker that we could get people to understand that we could have just adopted the state mandates, and then what's going to happen? State mandates. The state's going to come in. But we wanted local control, and we adopted local control when we adopted that document. And unfortunately, there's just all kinds of just stuff flying out there about how we've given up the farm. This council's given up the farm. We're looking out for our citizens and we want the best for this city. I don't think any of the five of us would be on here if we didn't want it. And I am gonna I want to compliment you, city manager Ledbetter, because you came to us at a time when we were very vulnerable. You were very honest with us and you stepped in and you took the bull by the horns. And it was for my three year pride on the council, you know, no disrespect because don't see the my friend, but it was kind of a, it was my friend, but it was a, that bowl was bucking a lot. And there was, there was a lot going on there. And we got thrown a lot. And I want to thank your staff for being excited about what they're doing because houses equal business, business equals streets, sidewalks, cops, maybe a paid fire department. It equals a lot of stuff, and we want to encourage this to come in. And again, Facebook's very unscientific, but just based on the two comments I got, the one was, yeah, we just we just need to get more business in here. So, you know, I want to thank the council for backing that home plan, and I want to thank the council for all you're doing. And if you haven't had a chance to read that book on middle housing, very very fascinating. It's 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 a great book, and it cites two neighborhoods that I know of. One of them is a neighborhood that Frank Lloyd Wright lived in as being having the, 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 the smaller dwellings in it. And if you've ever been able to go there and walk through it, you don't see the dwellings. All you see is Frank Lloyd Wright houses all around you. And the other one is actually Bay Ridge, where my daughter lives for four and a half years. And when you walk through Bay Ridge in Brooklyn, again, you don't notice that there are smaller cottages there because it's all part of the architecture. So I think we, we all we all want the same thing. We don't want something to stick out. And that's what you're doing for us by bringing us these properties for us to look at because we're trying to control the growth. We don't want apartments up on Niner Street. You know, we, we want them where they belong and where and, and where they fit in and where they're close to people for services. I even have my neighbor telling me, and I'm not going to mention any names at this point in time because he'll let people know, but he's called the city to talk to the city about buying a building in on one of the main streets here and turning the bottom back into business and then adding another floor. So you have the second and third floor and putting uh, apartments on the two top floor with uh, parking that is enclosed, totally underneath the building. Um, so, you know, people are thinking about it because we don't, Steve Baker and I used to talk a lot and I, we really don't have any developers in Siskiyou County. We just don't. We don't have any developers. We have some people that come close to being developers and thank God for that. And you all know who they are. But we don't have anybody that really wants to come in and say, hey, I'll put up, you know, 27 single family homes on, you know, in this area. Or I'll put up a, you know, a, uh, you know, eight cottages here, eight cottages here, and eight cottages here. So I want to thank the council, though, for standing up for this element. And I want to thank you and particularly your office for being excited about it. And yes, we did ask you to do a bunch of stuff. And yes, you got a positive evaluation from us. And yes, I, I, I'm going to say I want to see you say I think I, I can't speak for all of us, but I think we're all pretty positive. Uh, and, uh, you know, we need to come to you when we have, if we have issues, um, I urge any of us to go to him when you have those questions. I know that that's what Steve Baker said. Don't take me cold, you know, and, 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 and uh, you know, it's part of our training too, as far as the, you uh, uh, California League of Cities goes. So, but that we all do need to call like that at, at times, and I know I do, I have. So, but thank you for, thank your staff particularly for everything they're doing. Yeah. Thank you for the time, All right. Um, that's not much for me to say, really. Um, it's just unfortunate that some information to get around by a certain group and a certain individual regarding um, R1 zoning. It was 
Um, I received several calls from some elderly residents and had to clarify to them by that lie that went out on a flyer that we weren't changing their zoning. And it's not the city to say that California is just re, you know, redefining the term of single family dwelling. And so it got in the mix of very confused and very blunt lies of what was changing and shame on them, shame on them. Um, because it upset a lot of residents. And after I talked to them, they were very grateful that I explained to them, even though they didn't ask me to call, I called every single one of them and explained. And they were surprised I called them back. And uh, they were set at ease that what I told them. And it was very sad to have them upset and confused by this one person's lies and this flyer from a certain group. So, um, <clears throat> So yeah, you know, damage control is this actually the city council and our citizens that know the facts to set people straight that no, we're not damaging, we're not taking people's rights away and whatnot. You know, and cities change where it has been the same when I moved back here. I saw change for the worse, not change for the good. And me sitting here today, two years later, I'm proud of the council I sat with for two years. I'm proud of the council here for their opinions and their their homework and their research and you know moving forward it's not easy we're not going to agree on a lot of things but you know mr ledbetter or a city here but we walk away and we just have to remember why why we're here and this is the betterment um for the barrica and this is serving our citizens of barrica that put us in our seats so with that i will say good evening thank you for coming come back to see us have a good night meeting adjourned